sweet. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, sweet. So where were you born? I was born in Hilo mm -hmm. in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was, my mother was too young. She mm -hmm. was 15. So she didn't want to have a kid. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, from the very beginning, she didn't want to have me, mm -hmm. basically. And my grandmother um, was the one that her mom was the one that took me in, and uh, I became, in a Hawaiian sense, Hanai to my grandmother, which means she's now my mother. Mm. My real mom is now my sister. My uncles are my brothers. So it just it changes the whole thing. I become part of her generation. Part of her generation. Uh -huh. So that's how I was raised uh -huh. by my grandmother. And um, well, the, the the first big thing in my life was. One week before my first birthday was the tidal wave in Hilo, mm. 1960 tidal wave. Mm. And um, we were evacuated and we lived, we mm. lived along the Banyan Dry Peninsula where all the hotels mm. are today in Hilo. Mm. And that's right by the ocean. You know, mm. and, um, so our house was a couple, Maybe a thousand yards from the ocean like we are here. And the tidal wave was supposed to hit at one o'clock in the morning. Mm. And it never came. So civil defense gave it all clear at one and told people they can go back to their homes. So my grandfather being a fisherman, first thing was, oh, well, let's go back to the, you know, let's go home. And um, being, you know, a baby, mm. My, the story is that my grandmother went into the house, made my bottle, made me a bottle, and he went to the ocean to check it out. And all of a sudden, he comes running back saying, we gotta go, the water's pulling back. So we get about mm, maybe 2,000 yards, mm. or yeah, about 2,000 yards from the house running down the road trying mm. to get towards the airport to Hilo because mm. that was the highest ground mm. and we get caught in the backwater mm. the white water mm. the wave had already hit Hilo mm. and all that junk just started rolling back mm. caught us and just kept tumbling us in the water my grandfather holding on to my grandmother with one hand and holding on to me like a football and the, the, how it went my grandmother always said, you know, she kept yelling at him, don't let go of the boy. Mm. And that's, mm. that's why I'm still there today wow. because he, he was a good swimmer. Uh. He was a net fisherman, so he could swim with the net and the uh. lead. And uh. He was a really good swimmer, so he kept us all afloat. So that was my first, I guess, first experience with the ocean and how I became part of the ocean. Mm. My grandma said, you part of the ocean. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah, I grew up with my grandparents and we got, you know, our land that we lived on was condemned by the state, put into a um, safety zone where people cannot live anymore. So they, they put us, they gave us a place. There was an area up in Waikia, which is like five miles from the ocean. And they gave my grandfather and all the, the people that lived around the ocean, the, uh, the evacuees or the people that got their land taken taken away, mm. got a small piece of property up by right Kea. And I remember my grandma always looking out of the patio that we had built, looking towards the ocean, mm. wanting to be down there mm. because um, you know, that's where she liked the most. Mm. And her whole, her whole childhood was, you know, pretty much next to the ocean mm. in Maui where she grew up. Mm. Um, gee, I don't know. Growing up was kind of tough. Mm. I was always by myself you know, mm. with my grandparents, with older, mm. older generation. Where my grandfather, he was a hard worker and I, I never have too many. I had a lot of friends, but I didn't get to play with other kids. Mm. 
I always had jobs to do. I always had mm. chores. Mm. That was absolutely the first thing. You come home from school, get a snack, get out there and mm. do your chores. Mm. Once your chores are done, then do your homework, which, you know, for, like my grandmother, she only went to the night six, she went to school three years. Mm. Because at her time, um, was school was taught by Calvinist nuns. Mm. So it was real strict. If you couldn't speak English, you was getting punished. Mm. So a lot of times mm. she was getting punished more because she couldn't understand, she couldn't grow up speaking the language. She was. So we're talking in her age. In her, her age is the. We're talking 20s. like 1920s? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it had just happened, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like 30 much. years. 30 years. Yeah. Wow. So it was pretty hard for her. Yeah. Um, so religion wasn't, you know, that's out. Mm -hmm. Anything to do with on church. Grandma don't never like anything to do with mm. that. Um, but yeah, life was pretty tough. My grandfather, he was a, he was one of those that didn't spare the rod. Mm. He did something wrong, he's gonna get cracks. Mm. And I got a lot, mm. a lot of lickings, a lot of um, mm. close to being at the edge of of uh, child abuse. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I remember getting pretty beat up mm. a couple times um, and I was always thin mm. I was always a, a, a skinny guy mm. could never um, gain weight mm. and um, gee I don't know because <laughs> um, McGuire right your last name McGuire Ma so is that Scottish or Irish or did that name get given to someone at some point or how did where does that look that in? comes from my mom's father who came from Oahu his family uh-huh and his family um, as far back Hawaiian as I can get is his mom her name was Keala Hoy uh. Keala is and you know in that time that's Find your genealogy, that's how far you need to go, at least to the, a name that is all Hawaiian. Uh -huh. Sure. So Keala Hoi means path. Uh, Keala is the path, the trail, the, oh. the, the, the oh. way. Oh, interesting. And uh, Hoi is the paddle, the canoe paddle. Oh. So I never knew that, you know, I was part of one, or my bloodline was that of canoes and mm. ocean and. Mm. Um, mm. the path so the elders in Kau mm. when I started learning about being Hawaiian again mm. um, they was like oh ke alohoi ah no wonder you into canoes you know mm -hmm. that is your that is your kind um, mm. your bloodline mm. your great grandmother was probably someone who had the wisdom mm. because you know in ancient times the men don't get to keep men go out and fight mm. so the woman is the one that is given more of the knowledge she's the one that's gotta mm. remember things and mm. you know the ways how to do stuff mm -hmm. um, mm. so there was they, they would tell me that my grandmother was probably someone who knew navigation mm. or the ocean um, and was this the side of the family that you lived with, or the, that was the side of the, the family other I side? Never knew the other side. I still I've never met anybody from that side of the family. Oh, wow. So that would be your mom's father's side. Yeah, you said. Yeah. But so did your grandmother remarry at some she point? She remarried. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in later years, I found out that I think I was like fifteen or something. Um, one night I'm sleeping and early in the morning, it's, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning. Someone comes knocking at the door. And I get up, I answer the door, it's my grandma. And it's a telegraph, a telegram. Mm. And um, it's to inform her that the body of her husband, who was, I don't know how it worked, but I guess somehow she, they got her name instead of his yeah, current I guess, wife or, yeah, his yeah. current wife or whatever, but they came and notified mm. my grandmother. Mm. It seems that he was part of uh, the, uh, how do you, 
they were the guys that went to Alaska. Survey crew, he was part of the survey crew mm. that had to do the surveying for the Alaskan pipeline. Mm. From Alaska, you know, down to where the party is. Um, and if it's I think it's Anchorage mm -hmm. or whatever, but he was lost in a avalanche. Mm. Mm. And his body was never found until mm. 10, 15 years mm. later. And that's when this guy came over to the house. Oh. And that's, that was the first, I mean, I'd seen a couple pictures of you know my great grandfather, but um, or my grandfather, uh -huh. but never, never knew him, mm. never met him. Mm. So yeah, um, he was an adventurer too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Know, and um, goes back to that. What the elders had said the day to navigation and. Mm -hmm. So that, that made me think, oh, well, gee, that's why you must have known the sky. Mm. You know, because to do that kind in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you got to know the sky. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. don't know the sky, you're not going to get, you got to, yeah, you're going to get with modern, modern methods. Mm -hmm. You got to know some, have some knowledge of mm -hmm. the sky and what's what, mm -hmm. the stars. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So that's the McGuire name. That's the Maguire name. And yeah. then before that, the original. Hoy. It was H O E, Hoy. Hoy, yeah. Hoy, and that's the Canuta. Right, yeah. Um, so someone at some point married someone from Ireland? Or, yeah. Okay. And I don't even. Yeah, no, so you're Irish no Hawaiian. Yeah, Irish Hawaiian, and my real father is Portuguese. Oh, uh, okay. He's pure Portuguese, Portuguese okay. guy. Yeah. Yeah. I so met you're, him. you're a true. What's the word? Hapa? Or is that something different? Is that I'm right? I'm just, yeah, I'm, all, <laughs> I'm mixed. Mixed. We yeah. all are, right? right? We all are at this point. Yeah. yeah. But that, the, that Hawaiian bloodline is super strong within you. What you were able to trace back yeah. to, there's a, there's there, a, a, a teaching, there's a, a way of There's something in there, yeah, yeah that, you yeah. know, um, ancient knowledge that was kept yeah. between her and you know how they say your um, today they say well, it's all in your genes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's already embedded in us. Mm -hmm. So um, I take after my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially now with how my health is, it's mm -hmm. the same thing she went through oh, really? before she passed away. Mm -hmm. And we had always said that you know um, you take after your grandparents, not your parents. Huh. In the Hawaiian sense, oh. just one of them, one of the siblings are going to be more like their grandparents, and I guess I'm the one. Hmm. But like my grandmother, she didn't teach Hawaiian. She, she could speak Hawaiian, and, and you know she spoke English, but um, because of the way the world was changing, like my mother, the only thing she would, the, the, her whole scope was not being Hawaiian. Hmm. Because to be Hawaiian at her time, that was um, when statehood happened. I was born before statehood, so I'm actually born in the territory of Hawaii. Wow. Yeah. And her time was, you know, forget about being Hawaiian. You mm. want to be yeah. Western. Yeah. You want to learn everything Western mm. and teach them. All. My brothers and my, I have three brothers and a sister, and they've all. But for, for my mom, she knew more Western uh, education. My grandmother, she never know, you know, mm. math. She never know how to do math. I mean, mm. she didn't wear a hand, mm. mm -hmm. you know. Uh, her husband, my grandfather, he worked at Helco, so he knew a little bit. He was pretty good in math. Mm. My grandma could write, I mean, uh, and, you know, read, and mm -hmm. but... Um, she never, she wasn't a, a great teacher, so mm. I had some, I had a hard time learning. Mm. Mm. Did you, although, although did you know, smart. did you know much Hawaiian growing up? I never up? knew much no. Hawaiian, no, she never, mm. she was in this, I like teaching, but then how she was, how she grew up was sure. being punished for yeah. teaching that stuff and, yeah. and, you know, remembering those things, yeah. so she never shared much Hawaiian. Yeah. She she shared a lot about how to be by the ocean, mm. 
um, her, her, her thing was mostly, I guess, more, yeah, she always taught me, uh, you know, about the ocean. Mm. That's, that's what I remember the most. Mm. So you were always by the ocean we growing would, up? Yeah, more or less. When my, after mm. my grandfather would get off of work, first thing was grab his fishing nets mm. and head to the beach. Mm -hmm. So the ocean would you know, get back to where we came from. Yeah, and it's kind of a, spot. might be kind of a silly question, but I'm going to maybe be asking a lot of those. Is that the case for maybe everyone who's Hawaiian, or are there some people that maybe aren't really into going to the ocean or don't live a, well, that way? I think it... more Hawaiians. We tied to the ocean because generations and generations, that's where you get all your food. Yeah. You know, the land gives you some, but the land takes a long time. The ocean always get food. Mm -hmm. So I think more, more Hawaiians are part of the ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just who yeah. we are, who we yeah. are, you know? Yeah. And get, 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 I mean, there's a balance. A lot of guys, they like to go to the mountain, but mm -hmm. I think the ocean is what ties everybody together, most of us. Yeah. And, and more of the villages were, were closer to the ocean because, mm -hmm. like I said, that's where all the food was. Mm -hmm. That was our ice box, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, eat, go down <laughs> to the water and get some food. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, when you were in school, they weren't teaching Hawaiian? No. No, no they never no. have anything yeah. Hawaiian. Uh, once a year, we'd have this, I don't know, it was like a, a Hawaiian day maybe mm. and they put on you know they had a mm. like a pageant or something mm. um, they made one kind of ceremony around Hawaii but our the all the books that we read and everything that we were taught was nothing about Hawaii mm. this the, the uh, when my daughter was going to school crack me up, you know, 18 years later is my daughter with school books and the same book that we learned from is what she's learning from and hmm. how Hawaii became part of America was one paragraph and it said that the people wanted to become um, um, wanted to become part of the United hmm. States hmm. which is totally not true mm -hmm. um, there's Mm. You know, there's a petition that was signed by 30,000 Hawaiians at the time, which is a big number, mm. um, that, you know, asked the president to restore the, the, the Hawaiian kingdom. Mm -hmm. Historically, the president found out about the overthrow, sent an envoy to Hawaii. He mm -hmm. had made a report, went back to the president, was supposed to give Hawaii back, but he was elected out of office. Mm. So that whole thing just went like it does today. It just mm. goes to on the side. Mm -hmm. Next, continue on. Yeah, yeah. It's gone. So it's gone. Hawaii continues mm -hmm. to be part of the United States, mm -hmm. and everything is. It's it's all a matter of just that paperwork that. Or. Um, legal matters that no make sense mm -hmm. but when you were growing up you didn't you didn't know we any of that nothing right? about yeah Obertro, yeah none of us knew anything it was all in the the elders they all knew mm. and i guess they i don't know you know like in different parts different places kona puna hilo like hilo was the the main town so that's totally um, Western style. Mm. It's all a plantation, you know. It, mm -hmm. uh, foreigners that came to Hawaii invested money and started the plantation and then brought in because the Hawaiians didn't want to work for them. Just mm. Figured this is insane, you know, mm. what they're doing and did not want to work in the plantation. So they bring other race, other nationalities mm, to Hawaii, mm -hmm. the Chinese, mm -hmm. go, to, go to countries where pretty much anything is better than here. Yeah. 
if you worked in a plantation in the olden days, in the 40s to 60s maybe, plantation had everything. They had the, your doctor, your, they did this, you know, they did everything. They covered everything. They gave you a place to live. Um, you and they had their own store. Life is a lot better here than it was there. Sure. Way better, you know. Yeah. They're all living in camps. They get one camp of Filipinos, one camp is Japanese, one mm -hmm. camp is. And the owners of these plantations were primarily American. Primarily people? American. A lot of them were sons of the initial missionaries that came to Hawaii. You know, the kids. Mm -hmm. The missionaries when they first came because Hawaii was so spiritual, mm -hmm. um, when they did away with the um, Hawaiian system mm -hmm. of, of religion and went to the Western way of religion, and even that's another <laughs> you know, huge story of mm -hmm. how just that happened, but um, a lot of the old temples or the sacred areas were given to the missionaries for churches. So now these people living there, and as their children are growing up, they're starting to get more westernized. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking back at America thinking, well, if we could do this, we could do that. And because they were missionaries, or sons of missionaries, I guess they had the funds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was where it came from, but mm -hmm. they had the money to bring over materials, mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. and that was more or less the um, the reason why Hawaii was those the, the people that helped or did the overthrow. Their reasoning for doing it was because they were going to lose a lot of their investments. Mm -hmm. The queen was going to change the constitution mm -hmm. and. Things were on the edge of being changed, mm -hmm. and not for their betterment. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was like, wow, well, we better do something now mm -hmm. before that, before it changes. And I guess maybe the other countries that we had treaties might have gave, given mm -hmm. the Hawaiian people or the Hawaiian kingdom more backing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's. Like I say, it's a huge oh, it story. Is. Yeah. It's so tangled that, you yeah. know. Um, but the bottom line is it's it was totally illegal and not mm -hmm. right. And until mm -hmm. today, it hasn't been addressed. Uh, Clinton writes a law or, or signs a law saying, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we were part of the overthrow of Hawaii. We, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we're sorry. That was it. So it's like I go to your house, I steal your stuff, <laughs> take yeah. everything from you, and then... Tell you I'm sorry and just continue on. It's ours now and you know, it's been so long since it happened and so much has been invested, we really can't let it go. It would mm -hmm. be chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's true, it would be chaos, you know. All these companies, all this land mm -hmm. in the Hawaiian view, everything is still illegal. Mm -hmm. Every land title mm -hmm. is invalid. So there's this big issue amongst those who know about the financial side mm. say that, man, we, they owe us a lot. Mm. So, who knows? You yeah. Know? But you grow up, you grew up not knowing we, anything. Most, of, most people didn't. And there may, age, have, there may have been the elders that did know things, but they didn't talk about it, probably because of the way they were brought up. There was a lot of fear, and ju right? Yeah, there yeah. was, well, the fear and the knowing that the law today is on the other guy's side, sure. so you don't want to stir the pot. Sure. Because they'll come and take your stuff next. Mm. Mm. And who knows what they're going to do to you. Sure. So yeah, yeah. that was kept, you know, within small groups. Mm -hmm. mm. And fortunately, mm. those small groups survived enough to where, you know, after, after, the, after a lot of years of um, outside influence, I guess, we start thinking like them, mm -hmm. like the takers, mm -hmm. thinking, gee, maybe we could take it back. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's how basically sovereignty, the sovereignty movement, you know, started when 
the elders started telling small groups and then these small groups sovereignty movement's been all around for maybe 35 years mm -hmm. um, I got into it in I'm like the fifth year mm. of sovereignty going on and how old were you at that time I had already served my 10 years in our service okay and got out wow. and there was a time where I was just learning about being Hawaiian. I had mm. given up everything in Hilo, mm. you know, married twice, <laughs> kids, and uh, it was a tough time. Mm -hmm. Ten years in the service. You were in the Army, I right? was in the Army. Yeah. Was uh, that right after high school that you went into the no, Army? I I I worked other jobs before that. Mm. Uh, I didn't go and join the army until I was almost twenty. I was nineteen mm. when I joined. My um, I made twenty years old on the twentieth mile of the final test to to graduate in the army. So it was uh, it was an interesting night you know, mm. to do this. You do this whole thing where everything you've learned, you test on all these things, mm. and you gotta, you know, it's a 25 mile march going from this to that. Mm. And you know, each, each place you stop, you're tested on something else, mm. something that you've been taught. And so the 20th mile we were, was just about, was just after midnight. Mm. So my sergeant comes up to me and looks at me and says, Hey, pineapple, it's your 20th birthday, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, good. Give me 20. Where were you in basic training? Um, Where were you for that? Uh, Somewhere on the mainland? It was in Georgia. Oh, um, wow. Port Benning, Georgia. Yes. Whoa. Was that, and when you went to go to basic training into the Army, was that the first time that you had left the islands? or? Yeah, that's the first time I went to the mainland. Mm -hmm. it, was to, it was to join the Army. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so... Um, and you'd lived in Hilo the whole time up until that the point? The whole time. I'd gone to Oahu a yeah. couple of times with my grandparents. Um, my grandmother, she had some family there. In, my, in high school, I went on, we went on a, a bunch of us went on a surfing safari around the islands. That was pretty cool. We went one week, went to Oahu, we went to Maui, we went to Kauai. Fun. So it was a, it was a good time. There was eight of us. Cool. And those were all like you took the little island hopper planes? No, we took yeah, we took yeah, the regular Hawaiian airlines. Yeah, and there used to be a ferry. Right? There wasn't ferry short the ferry didn't last. Mm. <clears throat> there was actually two ferries. There was a one back in the eighties and there was one I think maybe twenty years later, back in the mm. early two thousand there was another one. Mm. Um but never, I mean, it was this big build up to the ferry. And when it started, people were, a lot of people objected. Mm. But there was millions spent on this ferry. Mm. I mean, they made this huge thing. I, I think there was, there was supposed to be two of them. Mm. I'm not too sure. Why would it only people, lasted Why would a people months. object to it? Because of the emissions in the ocean or? No, because people were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. They were taking resources from other islands. And it was like, it was like no, no kind of restrictions. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't really, I mean, they never, I guess they never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Those who planned this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But once it started, you know, people would come to the big island from Oahu mm -hmm. and say, go pick up here, go fishing, and just mm -hmm. wipe a place mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm get everything they can take them back to make money because mm. money was tight sure and so they'd go to the forest and just take mm. um, plants or different Wood stuff or, yeah. back to Oahu mm. again to make money mm. and this is going on in all the islands you know stuff was just um, it was just it was it was kind of the wild west mm -hmm. But people were just doing whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. They thought this was a great thing, sure. which it could have been, you know, if if mm -hmm. that um, 
a lack of term would be the greed sure. and, and the need for money, commercialism. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to, um, knowing that someplace else, I mean, they would even go into rivers and take all the river stones back to Oahu for simple stuff like emus, you know, ground ovens, Hawaiian ground ovens. Mm. But they wipe out the riverbed. Mm. Mm. And when you do that, you can change a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, you take out all those the boulders, big boulders, now there's nothing to slow down the mm. water, so it's moving quite fast. It's going to cut in the ground more deep. It's going to change plenty. Mm -hmm. People just don't realize that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You know, it's like, oh, just take the rocks. There's already plenty in the river. <laughs> yeah, well, there is a lot, but every single one has a purpose. Mm. That's why it's there. Mm. We never put them there. You guys got to remember, Akua put that there. Mm. You know, everything in the Hawaiian sense is here for us from Akua. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility to use it wisely mm -hmm. in a manner that, you know, continues on. Mm -hmm. it's, you got you to gotta think of the continuation of whatever resource you're touching mm -hmm. and you're using. For me, when I teach people how to make rope, I, I'm real strict that you know, unless you're gonna do them, unless you do it the way I'm trying to teach you, then you're gonna ruin it. Mm. And you know, then I don't like teach, and that's why a lot of the um, specialties, the weaving, the rope make, canoe building, there's the word kahuna mm. in front because that means mm. the secret. Mm. So you're going to keep, like for mm. me, I don't teach people everything that I know of canoes because mm. I know it's going to be abused. Mm. I mean, mm. it's not master. Mm. It's not learning the right way to do it, mm. but how not to do it. Mm. Mm. What does it work? Mm. Because we're always going to try to do something and, 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 and do it better. Mm. For me, that was the wrong way, actually, because the Hawaiian sense in teaching is close your mouth, open your ears, mm. open your eyes, and watch it. Don't ask me no question. Mm. I'm going to tell you how to do everything, mm. and at the end, you're not going to need to ask me no question because I'm going to show you what to do because it's, you know, you, that's what you've been taught. You've been taught the proper way to do things for generations, for thousands of years. For me in canoes, there was no teacher. I had to learn everything by, as the kapuna had said, Akua will put people in your path when mm. you need them. Mm. And that's how I learned a lot of stuff. Mm. How I learned to make rope from um, hibiscus tree. Mm. This guy's driving by and he's yelling at me, hey, my grandfather used to make rope out of that, that bark. So I'm looking at this, this big tree limb that I'm scraping off the bark mm. thinking oh wow used to make rope out of this mm. and here I am making necklaces you know I mm. made little um, carvings and I would make the rope for it and so I could go oh, right on <laughs> and also you know I was just starting to get into canoes down in mm. Punalu so that was my beginning so I kept some of that bark and I went back to that guy that was driving by and mm. I said so, how you doing? I, I don't know. I just know my grandfather used to use that. Mm. And that was it. Mm. You know, just a small, just small clue. Yeah. So now, it took me almost, it probably took me a year before I finally found the proper way to mm. um, not just harvest it mm. and what parts to use, but how to process it. Mm where it comes to the point where I can actually make mm. you know good quality rope mm. out of it mm. and then I mean yeah that took me took me quite <laughs> a while at, at first you know, I try and take a knife and stick it in between the layers because the how or the hibiscus the bark is pretty thick and and it has it's like cellophane tape <laughs> in layers or like mm. if you Look at on roll of tape mm. and how it's all stacked up on each other. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the same way this, this stuff is. Mm. 
So, but you got to get in between the layers so that mm. you can use the individual mm. ones. Mm. And I was just taking my knife and sticking them in between, and you're getting slivers and small pieces. Mm. Until one day, this, uh, this Hawaiian family comes to the beach down in Punalu, and I'm sitting down with them, and they invite me in, and, and I'm not from that area. Mm. That's the but Black Sands Beach, right? It's the Black Sands Beach, yeah. So I've just, you know, I've given up on Hilo and mm. gone to Kau, mm. got taken in by a couple of Hawaiians, and you know, I was, I was welcomed. Mm. And as other, as I met other people, and this was after the army, right? This is after the okay. army, yeah. This is in probably '93. So, when when you left the army, something shifted. You had a desire to learn more about what it means to be Hawaiian or just I had hit the end of my road you know at that mm. time it was a hard time mm. um, I went I'd gone through a lot of a lot of loss mm. mm -hmm. you know getting divorced twice was mm. was kind of hard mm. um and then, you know, getting out of the army, I had given up my career. Mm. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was destined to be a career soldier. Mm -hmm. um, so going there was like mm. the last, my last hurrah. I had gone there actually to let the ocean take me. Mm. If that's what it's going to be, then okay, take mm. me. Because so I went to Kau with mm. a backpack. My tent was a big trash bag. I had a um, couple of canned goods, and I used to gather opi from the shore, you know, the, um, those limpets. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most dangerous things to do because you're picking those up right at the crash, mm -hmm. where the waves mm -hmm. crash. So a lot of guys get mm -hmm. hurt, mm -hmm. lost at sea, they die, they drown. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, normally you don't do that by yourself. Mm -hmm. But I got it to the point where I was good enough that I did it by mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty successful. But that was one of my low points and I just, mm -hmm. I'd pretty much given up, you know. Mm -hmm. Then the ocean got really rough. I ran out of food. I was mm -hmm. just sitting at this place five miles from anybody, mm -hmm. just in the middle of no place on the lava field out in Kau, mm -hmm. towards the volcano. Mm -hmm. So I went to Punalu and then walked across the lava, mm. five miles, mm. to this little ancient um, village, mm. fishing village. And that's where I, I camped out there and just ate mm. up all my supplies, didn't have nothing, and mm. started asking Akua, because mm. I didn't know Akua at that time, I just asked the ocean. Mm. You know, mm. I, I never used the word God, I know that mm. I used um, the universe, mm. just because of my upbringing with my grandma, mm. Mm. not mm. wanting to, you know, get into the religion. But you felt a, a spirit. You, I always you knew know, the ocean. You always knew the ocean. The ocean was a spirit. Sure. You know? Yeah. That was the God, God. the power. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was the most, I, I listened to all, a lot of people say, well, God is everything. Well, that's the biggest everything I know <laughs> is that ocean. Sure. So that yeah. must be the most powerful. And since I'm tied to it, all right, you know, I yeah. can use that yeah. as my. As your higher power. As my higher power yeah. or, you know, my, something to lean on. Yeah. So. Um, so you asked the ocean. Yeah. There. So I asked the ocean to. Um, let me go pick some more peas so I can, you know, get more food. And next morning I woke up and the water was mm. like glass. Mm. Ran down and mm. got what I needed, said my thank yous and made a few calls. And that was pretty mm. much my start in Kau. Mm. Started meeting people. The first people I met, you know, was like, what I had talked about earlier was going to some somebody going to some other place and taking the resources. Mm. Mm. So these guys all looked at me like, "Wow, this guy here taking our resources." Mm. So 
So the first thing he said, oh, picky little peas. Oh, yeah, yeah, picky little peas. Oh, I'm planning, yeah, that, that good, that, that good. Well, you guys want some? Mm. Man, I'm sure, bro, you can uh, take what you like. And I gave them, you know, a big pile of peas. Mm. And they were kind of shocked, like, mm. wow. I said, bro, there's a lot more out there. I know what I'm doing. I can always go get more. Mm. Mm. And, and that, that was, was, that was it. That, that was the, my humbleness that allowed me to get big friends actually and so once those that first two guys we kind of say oh all right this is a cool guy mm -hmm. and as it built and built it became better and better friends mm -hmm. and more and more met more and more people and eventually i became part of kau mm -hmm. which was pretty amazing um and did that area kind of function a little bit differently? Maybe a little way bit... Way different from way any place else. Kind of more that's traditional? The, yeah, that's, that is the root of most... Um, most of the source of Hawaiian knowledge mm. was still kept in Ka'u. Mm. Um, the only place... Mm. The, there's only one person that I ever knew of that had knowledge of the Heiaos was this lady, Auntie Margaret Doncell. Mm. And she had some, she had some power. Mm. I mean, you know, everybody, Akra had, you know, her own way, mm -hmm. but this lady had, mm. had the way of Akra's mom's auntie, mm. who was from here. She was a living, living heritage. Mm. She was a hula master, mm. and her family was the ones that took it to Heiau. Mm. So it was the same kind of, Auntie Margaret was just, um, she had some mean power. Mm. When she could say prayers and mm. things would stop. Mm. I mean, mm. it's like time would freeze. Mm. She'd do whatever she needed done and things could come back to normal. Mm. And that was pretty amazing. And she was one of the ones that had taken me and um, mm. I, I didn't learn about the Heiaos, but there's a group of people that did. Mm. So today, right now, like Abel, he was part of that group mm. um, that, that know how to, how to do the, do get and use the energy of the Heiaos. Mm. It was a small group, and that's, mm. she was the only person that I ever knew. Mm. Um, Mary Pukui was the language person mm. that you know kept the the old Hawaiian language because you got to remember that within that hundred years, you learn you listening to all these other races and things start getting watery, watered down. Even um, values, mm. even the, you know the way people think mm -hmm. and their, their value system starts to change a mm -hmm. little bit because they're exposed to more mm -hmm. Western way. Sure. And the people of Kau, they were more secluded, so mm. they kept their traditional ways. And because of these few elders that really knew the traditional ways. You got to teach the, the next generation, which is, you know, fortunate for us. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where Hawaiian sovereignty started, mm. was in Kau. So it was in that area that you learned the truth of the yeah, things. Yeah, that's how I started to be Hawaiian. Mm. Um, I had, when I was down by that place secluded by myself, you know, nothing to do, I picked up a piece of coral mm. and I kept Grabbing them with, I made a fish hook at the end. Mm. And when I came out of there, I kept that fish hook. So one day this elder looks at me, she said, well, where'd you find that? Mm. I'm like, oh, I didn't find this, I made this. So mm. she took it from me, looked at it, and she was like, oh, wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> so she became one of my, my elders and started to teach. It was all, you know, the elders. The, the younger guys, they were all into their own thing, but mm. the, the elders, the, um, the grandparents, and the parents of the 
my generation, mm. they were the ones that had the, you know, had that old style. Mm. A lot of them today that you're from the same families that I didn't learn from, they're not even into what their parents had. Mm. Mm. They into totally other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when I started in canoes, it was it was really funny. Um, how I started in canoes was I was hitchhiking one day from the store, Kau down to the park. It's like ten miles. Mm. So I'm hitchhiking on the road, and this car car comes pulls up, and I kind of recognized the guy that's driving as an old classmate. Mm. So I jump in the car with him. He looks at me and says, "Hey, you know how's it?" Mm -hmm. Tell me, "Oh, how's it?" And introduced ourselves. He tell me, "Yeah, I remember you. You used to take my lunch money in school." You said that to him, or he, he said used, it? He said it to me because oh, you, I did. you took his lunch yeah. money. <laughs> I was kind of a bad boy at the time, I was, <laughs> but um, yeah, and um, we became friends. He had canoes. He had gone to um, Washington State, learned shipbuilding, um, and so he, since he had canoes, and I was a water guy. And he was, he was, you know, we became good friends, and he started teaching me and sharing with me the, mm. you know, canoes, letting me use a canoe, and mm. I, you know, I did whatever. Um, even when I didn't have anything, you know, no food, no money, mm. he needed help. I was always there to help him. Instead of worrying about myself, I'd always do that, mm. help others first. And uh, so one day he comes to me and he says, oh, let's go to Volcano or we're going to, he's going to check on a canoe for his kids. His wife gave, has given him, his wife was a doctor. So she was the doctor in Kau. And uh, he said, we'll go look at this, this canoe for the boys. He had two young boys. So I go with him and we're looking at this canoe and talking about it. And, okay, he pays for it, put it on his car. We start coming back to Kau and he said, well, you know, that canoe is yours. Hmm. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, Margaret bought you that canoe. Hmm. You know, we wanted to buy you this canoe for all the hard hmm. work you did for us. Hmm. We wanted to start you out. And, you know, in the beginning, I totally refused. I was like, hmm. no way, I'm not, he's going to do that. That's way too much. Was it a wooden canoe, like a? It was a fiberglass, fiberglass canoe. Button. That we found out later on, it was. Uh, it came. The mold came from a canoe that was around here. Mm. Someone had gone, asked the owner, and took a mold off of the wooden canoe, mm. koa canoe, mm. and used that canoe, the mold, to make twenty more canoes, mm. and a bunch of them went into one of the hotels in Hilo that had waterways. Mm. So these little, it was an 18 foot uh, three man canoes mm. made out of fiberglass. Mm. That was the first canoe I had. Mm. Yeah, and that was 30, about 30 years ago that happened. Mm. Then from there I just continued on learning, trying to build my own and um, it was amazing to to be this guy from someplace else that mm. didn't know about canoes. Mm. I had known the ocean because my grandfather was a fisherman. Mm. Um, I'd always been on the water. My first experience in the big ocean, mm. um, and not just in the little bays or in mm. a small boat, mm. was a friend of my grandfather had come to the house and said, Told my grandmother, hey, I like Bauer the boy. She said, they all called me the boy. And I'm like five years old. And here's this this man asking my grandmother if she, he can borrow me. My grandmother looked kind of strange at him. What do you mean? I need one partner for go fishing. My girls don't want to go fishing. Mm. And he had a big, mm. um, you know, 
cabin crews of kind of deep sea fishing kind of boat. Mm-hmm. Cat, uh, not catamaran, but a char- like a charter boat. Mm-hmm. But he had a big boat. But he had, didn't have a partner, so he had a hard time mm-hmm. fishing on the sure. boat by himself. Yeah. He said, oh, I'll take the boy. He know the ocean, yeah? And my grandma would look at him and tell him, oh, the boy, he know the ocean, good. <laughs> you can take him, but you make sure you bring him back. Mm-hmm. If you lose the boy, don't come back. So that was my beginning, and so from being you know five years old, not even going to school yet, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm sitting on a captain's chair of this nice big boat, and um, you, you know I called him uncle. He was a family, but mm-hmm. I call him uncle, Uncle Clarence. Um, anytime the wheels went off, first thing you know, give him the gas, give give him the gas so he can set the hook. And once he starts reeling in the light, you know, he runs to the back, puts me on the seat, on the captain's, on the driver's seat, and uh, he starts fighting the fish. And that was, I did that until I was like in intermediate school with him. Mm-hmm. And then when I was going to, he was a, a he was the head pro- professor or teacher at the community college in Hilo. Mm. He was the like the engineering side of mm. the community college. He taught welding, machinists, how to be a machinist. Cool. And so, you know, I, I was being geared up mm. to teach for him to become my teacher. So mm-hmm. he said, you know, take welding classes in high school. So I did a lot of welding classes. Oh, I was cool. into welding and <laughs> thinking, all right, man, I'm going to have this a good healthy future Mm -hmm. then he dies Mm. and then that was like oh Mm. since goes community college now i'm going to die and Mm. who won't teach me i ought to die Mm. and so instead i started doing other things i worked Mm. on the plantation actually Mm. being a regular laborer until I be, um, the boss kind of liked me and mm. started teaching me up with drive equipment and mm. did that for a while. Then when that kind of petered out, at, at one time the plantation was trying to find, figure out what other crops they could plant in Hawaii with all the land that they still had because mm. they had given up on sugar. Mm. And the reason they gave up on sugar is because um, most people don't know that the sugar in Hawaii was being subsidized by America. Mm. So for every pound, they would pay the plantation, America would pay the plantations for every pound of raw sugar that left Hawaii. Mm. Well, sugar was worth 30 cents a pound and the government would pay them a dollar 30 cents a pound. Mm. And that's how they Mm. kept these plantations Mm -hmm. running because it was a losing Mm. They were losing money every mm. year, mm. and um, chemicals that they used to mm. grow the sugar. Mm. Any time a chemical would be deemed too hazardous to use mm. in America, oh well, let's send it to Hawaii because they don't have the same rules. So it came like DDT mm-hmm. and all these, you know, mm. um, pesticides and chemicals that harmful mm-hmm. went into the, the land in Hawaii mm. and same like any other commercial thing you know they they just they use the land so much to give them enough time to rest mm-hmm. so the land becomes pretty much depleted of all its goodies <laughs> and a lot of times you know the way they did them all the topsoils running into the ocean, running into the rivers and going out into the ocean. Mm. So, yeah, I pretty much killed most of the land. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm way out of where I was. That's, that's great for now. It's okay, awesome. Okay, okay. cool. <laughs> Is you happy? I'm very happy. Okay. Yeah. That's Are you happy? Mean. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs>